This episode is brought to you by ForestBars.com, natural supplements for human enhancement. Forest produces full-spectrum, bioactive, mushroom-infused chocolate with powerful benefits, sustainably sourced and served. Receive 10% off your first order with code 0HOUR10. Welcome to today's talk with Dennis McKenna for a conversation about plant medicines, consciousness, and intelligence in nature. Our guest today, Dr. Dennis McKenna, has conducted research in ethnopharmacology for over 40 years. McKenna received his master's degree in botany at the University of Hawaii, then earned his doctorate in botanical sciences from the University of British Columbia. Since 2019, he has been working with colleagues to manifest a long-term dream, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy, a nonprofit organization dedicated to intellectual inquiry, spiritual development, philosophical discourse, and the enjoyment of human imagination and curiosity. With that, welcome. Thank you so much, Burton. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I appreciate the invitation and uh, uh, look forward to getting into some deep discussions or or not, depending on how the conversation goes. But anyway, thank you very much for asking me to come. It is an honor and we are grateful to have you. Let's dive right in by starting with asking what are psychedelics, their use case, and can you provide a brief history? (laughs) <laughs> that's a tall order in a <laughs> you know uh, it's hard to it's hard to do a, a, a thumbnail on that but so so how psychedelics as most people in your in your audience know are class of psychoactive drugs that have you know uh unique effects on consciousness you know and the reason they're called psychedelics there's one of many terms But I like psychedelics, even though it's got a lot of cultural baggage, but psychedelics is simple and and sufficiently vague, you know, because it means mind manifesting. And what psychedelics do is a lot of things, but whatever they do, they manifest the mind, you know, sometimes in good ways, hopefully most of the time in good ways, other times not so good ways, you know, psychedelic experiences can be challenging. But the point is, terminology wise, you know, psychedelics is a better term than hallucinogen or mystical mimetics or, 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 you know, psychotomimetics, all these are obsolete terms. Psychedelic has survived as a term and is now accepted in peer reviewed journals. That wasn't true a few years ago. As far as the, the history is concerned, it depends on when you want to start counting. You know, we've, we've had relationships with psychedelic plants and fungi for many thousands of years. Uh, some people would uh, speculate possibly millions of years. I'm one of those, but I'm, we don't have to go there today. That, that, that's, a whole other, that's a whole other seminar. Anyway, our relationship to these plants and fungi have have been, you know, through indigenous healing traditions and really all over the world, but kind of concentrated in the new world. We think of psychedelics as something in the new world, but there are certainly important psychedelics in, in Asia and Africa, such as iboga. So we, as a species, we have you know, a long association with, with psychedelics. And they they uh, come to us, you know, the institution that it comes through is basically shamanism, maybe the world's most ancient religion. And it's it's not really even a religion. It's, it's so far back. It, it's something that out of which religion, medicine, poetry, art, theater, all of these things find their roots in the psychedelic tradition. Shamans is a generic term, and it's an inaccurate term, you know, because uh, shaman, strictly speaking, shamanism, the word comes from Siberia. Certainly in in, uh, Siberia, there are ancient, you know, shamanic traditions involving, involving mushrooms. But in some ways, shamans are showmen. 
You know, I mean, in the sense that what they do is as much performance as anything else. And I don't want to uh, give the impression that they're always women. There, there are women and men shamans, you know. So does that kind of uh, place it for you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you okay. for that. I'm going to be turning it over to my co-host for today, Lewis Gale. All right, I successfully unmuted myself, so that's the first step in a good direction. Um, all right, so first of all, Dennis, uh, lovely to talk to you, um, and thank you for being here and spending this time with us. Um, I want to ask you a question around the history of psychedelics, really. So obviously the, the McKenna Academy has been working or working towards some policy to do with the Indigenous communities that that may have, uh, you know, quote-unquote discovered psychedelics or or mainly been the main users of psychedelics for a long time. What are we what are we doing or what can we do or what is the McKenna Academy doing to try and protect that knowledge that they have? Well, the McKenna Academy, you know, as the name implies, uh, where our mission is education. And we want to educate people about the the appropriate use of psychedelics. We want to educate people about their potential in medicine and also, you know, in in mental health care, but it goes beyond that. I think psychedelics are uh, some of the most important tools we have for exploration of consciousness, you know. I mean, they are lenses through which we can examine both our own consciousness and uh, through which we can examine the world. And uh, it's a unique filter. And we gain, if we look at natural phenomena, for example, through the lens of psychedelics, we uh, we can understand things about it that are not normally uh, apparent, you know, because what normal consciousness does is it 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 creates a background and a foreground and and the emphasis is on the foreground what's right in front of you things are going on in the background but we're we're programmed not to pay attention to those because they're not relevant to our immediate survival psychedelics temporarily disable that and they enable the background to be brought forward so you know you perceive things not only about internal processes but external processes that normally we're just not aware of so in that sense they're they're uh very useful we were talking about the the indigenous side you know i i guess i have just a small follow up on that we we obviously don't come from indigenous communities and we haven't been especially myself i haven't been around psychedelics since i was very young and it definitely hasn't been part of my culture when i was brought up how do you think sort of indigenous communities might feel have you had experience talking with indigenous communities about uh, how they feel with you know i guess quote unquote western civilization or or us as prof you know, professors or scientists looking into psychedelics how do you think they they might feel with sort of their their traditions or culture being looked into in that sense do you think they might it, have it, any feelings towards that well, definitely. It's it's complicated, actually, the way that they feel. In the one sense, they recognize the value of their medicines. This has always been known to them. And they are happy that finally the rest of the world is recognizing, you know, what they've always known. And they've been the stewards of this knowledge and the genetics behind it, the species behind it and the practices you know and and but indigenous people for historically have always been at the margins of society anyway now the rest of the world suddenly is noticing you know not that they haven't developed other indigenous medicines but psychedelics are in kind of a unique place and now suddenly they're the talk of the town you know on a global scale things like ayahuasca you know, back when I started working on ayahuasca 40 years ago, even longer, if you walked up to the average person on the street and said, do you know what, have you ever heard of ayahuasca? You know, they would have given you a blank stare. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Possibly, possibly, you know, called the cops or something for you harassing them. <laughs> Pretty much these days, anybody at least has heard of ayahuasca. You know, uh, I mean, they have some idea that it's a psychedelic 
beverage, that it's a brew, it comes from South America. They may not know much about it, but they have heard of it. And and so the the McKenna Academy is is committed to preserving this indigenous knowledge as much as possible and the species, but also building bridges to scientific knowledge, you know, and because these things are not incompatible. And indigenous people are not particularly interested in keeping it secret. They actually want to share their knowledge with the rest of the world, but they want it, they want their contribution to be recognized and they want to do it, they want it to be, you know, they want to be respected, you know, and they want there to be benefit sharing and they want to have a say in the way that these psychedelics are employed into uh, global 21st century culture. You know, there are sensitive ways to do it and not so sensitive ways to do it. And, and uh, th this is really emerging as a big issue for companies that are, interested in commercializing psychedelics, developing them for therapeutic purposes, especially if they want to use natural products. But the same issues kind of derive, uh, you know, apply to even synthetics like MDMA. MDMA is not a natural compound, but it certainly has precursors, natural precursors. And so they are interested in in fostering dialogues how can these things be integrated into the modern world modern medicine particularly but how can reciprocity be uh, implemented and, and recognition of what the indigenous people have you know they've been the steward of this for thousands of years they've gotten very little recognition so it's time that that changes and I, I don't think there's any one answer for this. I mean, there's no one indigenous group that owns psychedelics. And I personally believe that psychedelics like ayahuasca and mushrooms are, you know, the common heritage of humanity. I mean, everybody is indigenous to earth, right? And as a biologist, I'm more of a biologist than an anthropologist. And I think these things are co-evolutionary partners with the human species. And hence, we all have a stake in psychedelics, but we have to remember, we have to acknowledge the indigenous people have been the keepers of these traditions for so long. And that's a major thing because now they're here for the rest of the world, you know, when we need them more than ever. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Thanks for answering that. I personally, you know, with my experiences with psychedelics, I haven't personally dived my mind into the the impact of indigenous communities and the the knowledge and history there so uh, that's new for me um i'll pass it over to b -tabs. i think that was really well said i think that the audience here would also be quite intrigued to learn more about what the mckenna academy of natural philosophy is doing to develop a policy forum to protect indigenous knowledge and can you share a little bit more about your bionosis project please Right. Yes, I can talk about both of those things. So, the the policy forum that we're we're in the process of uh, just sort of conceiving right now, it has sort of emerged out of dialogues that I've been having with uh, both companies that want to develop psychedelic therapies based on natural psychedelics. That's sort of one side, and then some of these NGOs like. Uh, like ICERS, which is, stands for the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education, Research, and Service, and the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund. And these are NGOs that want to work with Indigenous people to, to develop these mechanisms. And, and so, you know, these are kind of the two major, and of course, the Indigenous people themselves. I mean, NGOs are often not even administered by indigenous people but they they want to you know foster these dialogues so so the idea of the policy forum is to just use the power of virtual meetings to do a one or two even two day symposium where all the stakeholders are invited everybody gets to put their views on the table you know kind of make their 
presentations and then have discussions and and try to focus, you know, try out of this, try to come up with some kind of a white paper or a policy statement or a report that can be shared with everybody in the community, ranging from indigenous to NGOs to corporate entities, you know, and, and in this space, you can't, you know, you can't necessarily, and there's a tendency to stigmatize corporations and say, well, they're just corporate predators, they're just only interested in profits and all that. Well, yeah, corporations, especially if they have shareholders, have a, a mission to show a profit. But many of the people who have been involved in founding these psychedelic-related corporations have done so out of a genuine desire to make life better, you know, to find better therapies for mental health. And, and, and you know, there is people that that go the corporate route, they still understand the issues and and there are good intentions there. It's it's not all that we're going to take this knowledge and and make billions of dollars out of it and and give nothing back. That's that's not what I see when I talk to to people in this space. So that is that's what we're trying to do with this policy forum and as far as the Biognosis, this is uh, in some ways similar. Biognosis is a kind of an umbrella term for an initiative we're working on in Peru. And there are some moving parts to it, various different phases of it. One of them is that we want to make a series of documentaries about the current state of traditional medicine, indigenous medicine in the Amazon in the communities around Iquitos, which is where I've worked for mostly for over 50 years. And we want to just essentially create a series of documentaries that's kind of a snapshot of the current state in the post-COVID, post-globalization, post-ayahuasca tourism era. How are these communities coping and you know what are their challenges and and what's working for them because these communities are quite re- quite resilient but they face challenges so that's one of the things and then the other aspect of biognosis is a, a longer term project having to do with the university in the, in Iquitos UNAP that I've worked with and this herbarium that they have uh, I've worked with the curator of the herbarium since we were both graduate students and when I came to Peru in 1981. He is an incredible uh, repository of knowledge about plants, medicines of all kinds. And he's the curator of the herbarium. And the herbarium is kind of, you know, it's a third world herbarium. It's kind of run down. It's underfunded. It faces a lot of challenges. But potentially, it has the potential to be a world-class institution for plant research in the Amazon. And part of that is to digitize the herbarium, which is what herbaria do these days. They digitize their specimens, they put them online, and open that up to the world, you know, again, in a way that respects indigenous knowledge, open it up to indigenous people, make it possible for them to contribute and we want to create this uh, this nexus, if you will, this this place where traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge come together in a collaborative, harmonious way that enriches both. And this is a three to five year project. We're trying; it's going to take serious money. You know, we're trying to raise about ten million dollars for this which on some scales is a lot of money and other scales, it's, you know, it's nothing. I mean, everything's relative. It's about one tenth the cost of an F-35 fighter plane. You can put it that (laughs) way. That's an interesting comparison. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. But we do have to raise money and this is what we want to do with it. And I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you links to all this after the the talk that you can uh, that you can explore or even post on your on your websites about this project. Incredible, Dennis. That's a that's a great explanation there and a great comparison. I might just ask. So you're obviously really well known for the stone stone ape theory. 
Um, could you do me a favor and just give a tiny brief overview of what the stone date theory is and its potential implication for how we think about psychedelics? Okay, well, yes, I, I could give a brief uh, overview. It's, uh, I mean, it's not such a crazy idea. The idea is, you know, referent to what I was talking about a few minutes ago, that these these plants and fungi are really co-evolutionary partners with the human species. And, and in that context, mushrooms are, are probably the primary one because we, if you look at the paleontological data, the climatological data, the fossil data for where hominids evolved in Africa, you know, three to five year, million years ago, we made a transition from being not human, you know, being, uh, you know, some other species to being homo, homo sapiens, which ironically means the wise ape. You know, I don't know if we are worthy of, anyway, that's a tangent. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm not sure if we're worthy of that either. But <laughs> we digress. But, but the thing is, the environment that hominids evolved in was clearly the climatic conditions were favorable to mushrooms. There were cattle in the area. In fact, cattle were, you know, the precursors of modern cattle. The fossil evidence has been found and the, the cattle or cattle-like animals in this, in this grasslands environment were there. People ate these cattle. This was probably something that uh, you know, it was a major source of their of their protein. Uh, but also, as it happens, the 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 dung of the cattle is the preferred substrate for psilocybe cubensis, which is the pantropical psilocybin mushroom. And if you go to any tropical pasture where there are cattle these days, in the right, you know, around the equator. You're going to find these mushrooms, you know, if it's in the rainy season, it's just something that shows up. So it's reasonable to think that those mushrooms were present in these environment and being hominid, being primates, being hungry primates, you know, scanning the environment for anything good to eat. They could not have overlooked these. And once they found these things and started consuming them. The idea of the whole stoned ape theory is that over the course of, you know, evolutionary epochs, it could have uh, contributed to the emergence of consciousness, language, the ability to visualize things internally, which is a lot of what creativity is, and the linkage between language and visual symbols is a connection that the mushroom can make. This is why in these indigenous uh, situations, you know, the songs and the sounds and, and the oral environment that is created is so important to, you know, modulating the course of the trip because what psychedelics can do reliably is a process of synesthesia. Synesthesia is where you have a translation of one sensory modality into another and you can literally see sounds and that sort of thing and you know in the psychedelic state and this can be internalized because if you think about it that's what language is language is effectively a synesthetic process where you know i'm on this microphone talking to you making small mouth noises you know, which would be meaningless, except that we understand each other. Yeah, yeah, you're, a you're lot completely of that, right. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, that we have this common language and, and the words I'm saying are reflected in your head by images. So mushrooms could have been the software, essentially, that taught these evolving brains to discover consciousness to and and create language and create the imagination effectively you know imagination is what these things engendered in these evolving primates once you have imagination you know then you're off and running you know because if you look at the modern world if you look at artifacts if you look at technology you know everything that we create was an idea in somebody's head at some point. You know, it was an 
abstraction. Somebody had an idea, you know, I'm going to make a glass, for instance. They get the idea of the, and then they go out and do it, you know. So mushrooms provided that ability to visualize internally. And then because we have these opposable thumbs and we're restless and, you know, we want to manipulate the world, we can conceive ideas and then we can go out and, and build stuff, whether, you know, maybe we make a ceramic bowl, maybe we make a starship, you know, but the basic process is the same, taking abstract ideas, projecting them into the external world. That's what we do. That's what sets us as humans apart from from apes and, and other primates. You know, they they may have, they may use tools, you know, they have digging sticks to, to dig termites out of logs. We don't see them building computers and, and that kind of yeah. stuff. You know, this is, you might call it's, us the homo technoensis almost, you know. It's really interesting because you're essentially, to summarize that to a degree, it's how world will only ever develop as far as our imaginations can see. You know, like without an imagination, without ideas, our world just wouldn't develop. So the concept right. is that we we brought imagination to the forefront, which then allowed us to advance ourselves as a species so much faster than, than might be previous. Um, and that's a really yeah. interesting thought. Yeah, and that's exactly what psychedelics do. I mean, psychedelics, you know, we have an imagination, but psychedelics open the door on imagination. They may have been uh, played an important role in the origins of uh, imagination, you know, th two to three million years ago. We know when pretty much those are the eras that, that this took place. But even now, creativity, art, artistry, technology, science, everything we do is really powered by imagination in a certain in a certain way. And, you know, psychedelics facilitate imagination. They facilitate ideation. And it's interesting to me that the things that you, you see on psychedelics, the visions that you have on psychedelics are as astonishing to me, you know, as a 21st century technological literate, you know, scientifically educated person but they're as astonishing to me as my uh, indigenous brother 15, 20,000 years ago. I mean, they must have eaten these mushrooms and wondered, pardon the expression, WTF? <laughs> <laughs> what is <laughs> happening here? <laughs> and we, our reaction is the same. <laughs> and, and, and you bring up your brother, and I'd love to dive a little bit deeper uh, because you did invoke that term. Uh, you and your brother, Terrence McKenna, have uh, been quite well known for your writings about entities that exist within yep. psychedelics. What does that refer to? Well, entities... Uh refers to you know these apparent encounters that you have you know with entities in the psychedelic space and by entities i mean conscious entities that appear to not be yourself be different than yourself now, now you know it gets tricky because they may well be a part of yourself that's presenting as something that's not you, you know, in other words, it comes from the unconscious, you know, or some unconscious part that for some reason, psychedelics open a window onto that. And you're communicating with an apparently intelligent entity. It may originate in a deep part of, it, of the self. It may originate from outside, whatever we mean by that you know, some other dimension. These these words get very slippery when, when you can toss them around quite carefully, but when you actually try to think about it, what do we mean by outside? You know, what do we mean by inside? I mean, one thing that uh, psychedelics and the study of psychology tells us is that we're living in a synthetic reality. We're living in a model of reality that our brains construct and it's largely defined by what is not what is admitted through our sensory pathways it's largely defined by what is filtered out and psychedelics 
can disable those filters temporarily. They just open the floodgates. All this information starts pouring in. Normally, in normal normal consciousness, whatever that means, it's not in our interest to be overwhelmed with all this information. You know, we have to be able to drive our car and open a can of tuna fish and and do the normal things that, you know, we do as, as people. But once in a while, it's good to lower all of that, just demolish it. I think this is where, not demolish it, let's call it disable. It's kind of like rebooting your computer. And this is where the therapeutic, I think, the therapeutic power of psychedelics is. It lets you step out of this reference frame, this default mode network that it's called, or now I prefer to call it the reality hallucination. But that that term has not taken, you know, default mode network sounds more, more respectable. But the fact that it lets you step out of this framework, this artificial this model of reality that you've created and look at your situation at arm's length, as it were. And, and if, if you're dealing with issues like trauma or depression or addiction or the various uh, things that psychedelics are therapeutically, you know, useful for, I really think the therapeutic power, you know, the, the psychedelics are the closest thing we've come to, what you might call a broad spectrum psychopharmaceutical in the sense of a broad spectrum antibiotic, you know, it hits a lot of different bugs, you know, and, and a broad spectrum uh, psychopharmaceutical uh, or, 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 you know, psychoactive drug like a psychedelic. Why is it good for all of these different things, you know, depression, addiction, trauma, anxiety. I think it's because at base, it lets you separate yourself from those, look at them from a different perspective and get a handle on them, you know, and they become less, less challenging. And then I do think that psychedelics are a lot like rebooting your computer, you know, in a very, in a pretty close analogy, you, you know, how when your computer gets clutched up, I don't know if yours does, but mine does all the time. <laughs> You know, you just restart the sucker and somehow it comes back up after a while and it works better for a while. Yeah. And I think that's what's going on with this uh, this default mode network. You know, it it is more efficient after after you rebuild it. And and these systems are incredibly resilient. They tend to, you know, go toward a certain equilibrium so that when you know, so you you disable this default mode network and you're in a place where, you know, hopefully you've been careful about your setting, want to do this in a place where you don't have to worry about setting other than appropriateness and safety. But then in, in this environment, you're free to surrender to whatever comes in. Knowing that it's, it's all going to fall back together, you know, in a few hours, that default mode network will reconstruct itself and it will be more efficient. And there's very little danger that you're never going to find your way back. It does happen. I mean, it, it, we have, you know, persistent hallucinogen, perceptual disorder and things like this, but that's a very rare thing, you know, that people do not recover fully and are able to get back into their ordinary boring state of, normal content yeah i i think um for a lot of people who may be new to psychedelics the the example or analogy of rebooting a computer or, or a phone or whatever it is is a really great one because it's something that we can all relate to because there's every single one of us has had a time when something technology wise just hasn't been uh going the right way and then you just, you know, frustratedly hit the off button and leave it for 10 seconds and then turn it back on and suddenly it works again. So I think mm -hmm. that's a, a really great analogy. And I think everyone can relate to that. Um, off the back of that, can you tell us about what is telepathy? And, uh, and I'm going to butcher this word. Are you ready? 
uh, her mind and how does it relate to the psychoactive drink um, ayahuasca? Okay, well, well, telepathy is the ability to tune in on some wavelength, some frequency to what other people are thinking. Ayahuasca kind of has an un, undeserved rep. Well, maybe it is deserved. I don't know. It, it is one of those where in group situations, it, it does happen not infrequently that people apparently get into uh, collective states of mind where everybody is seeing the same thing. You know, at least we assume they're seeing the same thing based on their descriptions of, of what's happening. But it's so that would be telepathy. You know, it's not reliably, it doesn't always happen, but it does happen. Ayahuasca used to have a reputation before it was still more of a, a mysterious thing. And they, uh, early in the 20th century, chemists were isolating different alkaloids from, from Banisteriopsis. And one of the alkaloids that was, uh, that was isolated was named telepathy, you know, because of this reputation. And then that that alkaloid turned out to actually be harming, which had been isolated by some other researchers previously. So harming gets precedence, you know, but telepathy is certainly a suggestive name. Does uh, ayahuasca facilitate telepathy? Quite possibly it does, you know. I mean, what there needs to be, and there's been very little of, uh, work on this, but uh, there does need to be more work on psychedelics and the paranormal, you know, and telepathy would fall into that category. Can, is it possible to do a controlled study with ayahuasca or mushrooms or one of these things and demonstrate that there is telepathy? you know, that it does. And how would you, how would you approach that? Certainly there are like anecdotal approaches. I don't know if you could study it systematically. A person that's done a lot of work in this area, uh, at least a lot of talking about it, I don't know how much actual studies he's done, but is uh, Dr. David Luke in, in the UK. He's written about extraordinary human experiences, which psychedelics are some of those and paranormal experiences are among those. I mean, it's it's interesting that in the indigenous context, the psychedelics are used by the community to do things like predict the weather and identify where is the game going to be in the you know six months from now. Where's the good hunting going to be? Or so to predict the future to to do different things. The problem is that they they don't work very well in that respect. I mean, they're often you know, these are often no more than guesses, but there may be a way to use psychedelics for things like telepathy. That's an obvious one. Other things like precognition and so on, you know, could be approached that it's just not being investigated very much, you know. I mean, the whole okay. area of psi research, you know, paranormal research has been stigmatized anyway. And so that's a problem, you know. Just a quick follow up there. I um, you mentioned talking about how to study sort of the effects of of psychedelics. I am by no means, shape, or form a anything doctor related or professor or anything. So my my lack of knowledge here is immense. Uh, but it, it does it present challenges when uh individuals or facilities try and study the effects of psychedelics simply because they're not sort of physiological in the sense of if you have high blood pressure you take blood pressure medication and typically the blood pressure goes down um with psychedelics the experiences like telepathy and so on are so uh i would say almost bespoke to the person who's having the experience and then i would imagine that's pretty hard to measure from a from a scientific perspective, does that present a challenge when trying to sort of further research into psychedelic? Well, yes, yes, it does. You know, I mean, to try and construct experiments around this kind of thing, you know, is, is just very difficult. I mean, even if you take psychedelics out of the equation, you know, and you try to 
uh, set up a protocol, you know, for for measuring something like telepathy might be uh, structured around something of as simple as a card trick. Guess what card I'm holding? Or I'm in another room and I put a drawing on the paper and the person in the other room tries to draw what I drew, remote viewing things. Sometimes these come through, you know, with very suggestive results. <clears throat> other times they don't. You can imagine how it's going to complicate things if you have uh, one of your subjects or both of your subjects in a profoundly altered state. I mean, it's just difficult because there's resistance to being within the in the constraints of that experimental design. I mean, they want to just keeping the tension on it is a challenge because, you know, they want to go cruising off into the universe and enjoy visions and talk to entities and this kind of thing. So it's tough to study. It's it's tough to sort of think. There was early in, in the 60s, there was an interesting study. You've heard of the contact high. And there's there was actually an interesting study where they had a couple of subjects. But the basic structure of the study is they had people in different rooms, separated by some distance in, in the same clinical building, but in different, in, in different rooms. They gave one person LSD. And if the person had a dominant personality, if they were the dominant in this relationship, they gave somebody LSD and the person who would got the placebo also had a psychedelic experience. And then they reversed that, gave the person who was the submissive one or the, you know, less dominant one, uh, a psych, they gave them LSD and neither, and the other person did not have one. And this is separated in space and time. I, I don't describe this very clearly, but seemed at the time, it seemed like a, very interesting result, and and it was in the context of the multi-part paper uh, called "External Chemical Messengers." Is what it was about, published back in the sixties, and and the premise of it was that people were getting essentially pheromonal stimuli from the other person; that there was actually a a chemical messenger that uh, exchange that was involved in that. Wow. And, you know, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting paper on almost totally overlooked. It was called uh, External Chemical Messengers in, I think, the New York State Journal of Medicine. I mean, very obscure, six part by a psychiatrist named Harry uh, Weiner, I believe. And it was, uh, uh, we're sort of off on a tangent here, but it was basically a theory of pineal function. That's what he was interested in and his his premise was that the pineal gland is actually a source of exohormones as well as endohormones and the pineal gland mediates social relationships through these uh, pheromonal mechanisms but we're we're way off in the weeds here so we probably don't have time to get too much into that my that recollection is is incomplete anyway but uh, I can send you the link to this paper. That is quite interesting. And mm -hmm. in keeping with what can be measured and with objectivity, is it true that you have a theory suggesting DMT exists within all plants to some level? And more broadly, can you discuss consciousness in nature in general? Sure. Right. Well, the DMT exists in everything. This premise is, uh, is not so... It's a reasonable supposition, you know, basically, because DMT is only two steps from tryptophan, right? And tryptophan is an amino acid that is in everything because it's one of the 20 amino acids that go in to make proteins. So tryptamine is universal in uh, living things. And DMT is only two, two enzymatic steps away from tryptophan. Tryptophan has to be decarboxylated to tryptamine. There are enzymes pretty much everywhere in cells that will do that. And then it has to be methylated on the nitrogen. So decarboxylation and then N-methylation, two trivial biochemical steps. And there 
enzymes pretty much all over the place that will do that. So I think it's reasonable to think that DMT is probably present in all plants to some degree, and then some plants, you know, overexpress it. And those are the ones that we get interested in because they work. My guess is that if you could just develop very sensitive chemical assays for DMT, uh, like GCMS fingerprint or something, just started randomly sampling plants, you'd find traces of DMT everywhere. You know, it just it permeates nature, really. What was the other part? Yeah, that, that's really fascinating. And the the inquiry regarding consciousness in nature, I think is a relevant one. Right. Well, consciousness, yeah, consciousness in nature, we're beginning to understand a few things about consciousness that and it turns out that brains are overrated. You know, there are there are conscious systems that don't necessarily involve nervous systems, you know, as we understand that. If you look at what they do involve is hyperconnected networks, hyperconnected uh networks which may exist well obviously the brain is an example of this the the neurons are hyperconnected and uh, packed inside a very confined space and and this is a nexus of consciousness at least most of the time although we also know many people that consciousness never came near them. You know, they have brains, but no consciousness. Anyway, but if you look at other systems in nature, for example, mycelial networks uh, or some of these old growth forest networks, and if you look at the way that those things are regulated, these are complex networks, sometimes covering miles of mycorrhiza, which are plant root fungus symbiotic uh, relationships you know the the mycorrhizae the the fungal part of this forms a connection to the roots of the plants that facilitates nutrient uptake and this sort of thing but it turns out it also facilitates communication uh, in these old growth forests are essentially like large nervous systems and their their signal transduction processes that regulate the exchange of nutrients and gases and so on in these old growth forest ecosystems so that, that's just one example there's a wonderful book called finding the mother tree which is by a forester a, a woman here in british columbia who do her, did her work uh, on these old growth forests and the regulation of the stability of these ecosystems through these signal transduction processes. And she got a lot of pushback from conventional foresters who you know, wanted a good excuse to uh, basically cut all the trees down, you know, just clear cut everything. But her work showed that that doesn't work. That that doesn't help maintain the the integrity of ecosystems. And she got a lot of lot of criticism for her work. But she just kept kept publishing in uh, journals like Nature, for example, which is kind of you know. I mean, her work is top quality. I highly recommend that book. And and you see this again and again in nature, where you have these communication systems, and it's all about these networks and that effectively is what i mean nature i think is uh, you know you've heard of the gaia hypothesis the it's not new age woo woo it's actually pretty solidly based in geophysics and biology and and geochemistry and all of these things where the the biosphere itself the collectivity of living species on the planet is really a sentient entity in itself, the term is superorganism, you know, uh, an organism that incorporates many other organisms as, as subcomponents. And the biosphere is that. It, it is a, you can think of it as a superorganism. We are superorganisms, you know, we have a good deal of our biomass is made up from our microbiomes, you know, a good deal of 
what we're made up of is not genetically Dennis McKenna. It's Dennis McKenna's bacteria. So superorganisms, beehives, termite nests, you know, they're everywhere. Uh, these uh, and, the, and really these old growth forests in a certain sense are also superorganisms. Another example is aspen trees. You know, you look at an aspen, aspen forest and, and it appears to be many trunks. That's actually one tree. Right. It's a clonal forest where it all came if you sample DNA at different parts of the of the aspen forest, you get the same DNA fingerprint. It's all the same tree, but it has many stems, basically, is, is the way to way to think of it. So we encounter intelligence in nature all over the place. And and I think that I am, I guess you could say that I'm a panpsychist. If if I have any religion at all, I, it's panpsychism. And panpsychism, you know, is the idea that consciousness is built into the structure of reality at the most fundamental level. You know, everything is consciousness. Everything is conscious in a certain sense, in that not conscious necessarily in the way that we are, you know, because we have complex nervous systems, but conscious in the way that it is. Even an electron is conscious in that it experiences its own existence, if you will. It probably doesn't reflect on it or anything. But it has that experience of isness, and that's a kind of kernel of consciousness in a certain way. So then, when you get these complex systems that are, you know, build on each other in these these networks of complexity, you know, as you go from the inorganic to the organic, you get a complex enough organic system. Out of that, you get life. And once you get life, you know, I don't think life can exist without a, without consciousness. We th these are not separable, you know. So, so consciousness is is everywhere, and and it's uh, it's interesting that this is the indigenous worldview, animism, uh, as the idea of everything has a consciousness in a certain sense. Animism is pretty much universal in indigenous worldviews. And it now turns out they were pretty much right. You know, the current uh, scientific worldview is basically atomistic. That is beautifully put. Thank you so much for that reply. So we we're talking about some uh, some published uh, published books that um, uh, you mentioned were were done in respect to a few different areas. I'd like to switch gears and talk about. A book that you've published, so the Magic Mushrooms Growers Guide, um, which was from a very long time ago, and a, a technique you sort of cultivated when cultivating rather psilocybin mushrooms. Could you tell us about the book and give us? I know it's a, very hard to sum up a book in a short period of time, but give us an overview of 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 your work in terms of what you published and what it's about. Okay, well, yeah, of all all this things that Terence and I have done and all the stuff that we've published and and talked about and all this, you know, which uh, which we're known for, probably the most significant thing we've done in terms of its aspect, its 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 impact on society was this magic mushroom growers guide. And that was a really not even a book. It doesn't come up to that level it was almost a pamphlet but it it was a book that we published in 1975 and this was a result of our trip to south america in 1971 when we encountered the mushrooms and you know there's a whole mythopoetic story about that you can read about that on the mckenna academy but long story short we brought spores of the mushroom back and we wanted to figure out how to grow them so that we could continue to access these experiences and and more more importantly we wanted other people to be able to access them as well so that they could confirm these crazy experiences that we were having or they could dismiss us as completely nuts and say well those that's not happening it turns out it is happening to most people so so we published this very simple technique that almost any intelligent 11th grader could master. 
And a lot of them did, apparently. I can imagine many a science fiction, or rather many a science fair project, you know, was conducted in basements around the country by nerdy uh, young high school kids who wanted to play with mushrooms or the parents were not necessarily aware that they were actually growing psychedelic mushrooms downstairs mushrooms yeah the they wild can't... so so we published this thing and and got it out there and, and a lot of people you know were able to master it they're much better techniques now for doing it but it worked at the time and you know there were other people growing mushrooms at the time but they weren't publishing anything about it they they were keeping it secret we wanted to share the secret and bring it to the world and that seems to be the right call because that made mushrooms you know that did bring mushrooms to the world and for the next you know 40 years or so when it came to psychedelics it was pretty much mushrooms were it i mean there was lsd around and there were mushrooms and and other things, but uh, that that was the motivation for doing the magic mushroom growers guide was uh, just just so that other people could do it. And many people, uh, the book still still sells steadily, um, which is good. I, I, I guess uh, you know, like I say, there are simpler techniques, but for people with uh, limited access to uh, growth chambers and that sort of thing. This is something you can basically, if you have a spare closet, you can grow a few jars and get plenty of mushrooms for yourself and your friends. I wouldn't recommend it of a, for large scale production, although people have done that. And back in the day, we did that, but it's labor intensive for sure. For, for someone who's ultra curious, um, could you give us just a super brief rundown of what the process is? The process of growing these things? Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you get the spores on a spore print, right? Which is you, you can make from the mushrooms. You just put the cap on a piece of paper or, or a microscope slide is a better thing. The spores will deposit. And then you have to have more or less sterile conditions, not not strictly, but it helps you cook up some some growth medium. You know, it, it's potato dextrose auger or something like that. It's a it's a gel like substance that uh, has nutrients in it, like maltose and dextrose, simple sugars. You can germinate the spores on that. And they'll start to grow out, you know, and then you can collect the mycelium from this. You can grow these Petri plates and then you can inoculate them onto substrates of sterilized grain, usually rye, which you make in a pressure cooker. You use uh, mason jars, in the, like quart mason jars or pint mason jars or whatever. You inoculate the mycelium onto that. And then after a few days, it takes about a week to 10 days to grow through the, to permeate the rye. And, you know, the rye goes from being brown color uh, to be pure white. And if you're lucky, you don't have any molds. This is the, this is the big problem. You have to be careful not to get other molds in there to contaminate it. But with a few simple steps, you can keep it pretty sterile, it grows through there. And and then you have the spawn. And then in normal mushroom growing, you would take that spawn and you would spread it on a substrate of like sterilized horse manure, cow manure with straw, that sort of thing. But you can just keep it in the jar and you can cover it with a layer of soil called casing soil, basically made from peat moss and calcium carbonate, a couple of other things. Keep it in a moist chamber, like a terrarium, and mycelium will eventually it'll form rooting bodies. You know, it will mushrooms will push up through the the surface, and and there you have it. You know, the carpophores. I make it sound more complicated than it is, but but then you can harvest that and uh, dry those or not. You can just consume them right out of the jar if you want, but. Most people dry them and uh, seal them up and they keep for a long time. And that's basically it. It's a pretty simple process. Mycology 101 for you right there. 
Dennis, I would love to get your thoughts on some of the, the latest news. Australia has become the first country to recognize MDMA and psilocybin as therapeutic medicines. And Rick Doblin from MAPS has been quoted as believing that MDMA will be approved by the FDA for treating PTSD this year or next. What are your thoughts on the future of the space for regulatory approval? Well, I think it's very promising. You know, I mean, obviously it's happening. And I was surprised kind of that Australia was, uh, you know, maybe the first company, uh, country to kind of open this up across the board because Australian laws have been pretty draconian up to now. So I'm glad. I mean, somebody is maybe different regulators. Maybe maybe they're smoking the right stuff now, and it's cleared their minds, and they've uh, you know they they have a path forward to developing developing psychedelics as as medicines. And they're not the only ones. I think you're going to see the same thing happen in the states and in in Canada and in Europe. All the trends are in that direction, and it's not going to happen the same way, you know, in every country. I mean, I think in the states, it's interesting that it seems to be happening at the state level and the municipality level. The these substances are being decriminalized, and that's the first step. And it's always been abhorrent to me the very idea that they, they were ever criminalized in the first place. I mean, you can't criminalize an organism that's ridiculous you know but that that was the mindset the only criminals involved in that relationship are the humans that try to suppress these things but you know but that said i i think you do have to have if you're going to use them therapeutically medically there has to be some modicum of regulation but i think that people for example if people want to say take the the magic mushroom growers guide method the old old scenaric method and grow a few mushrooms in their back closet there should be no prohibition against that or finding mushrooms in in the field this is not something that should be uh, prohibited. I think people, you know, I've, I've often sort of talked about how people have, a, this is a symbiotic relationship. And I've often said people have a right to symbiosis. And it, it goes beyond human rights because we're talking about rights of living things. Any living thing should have the right to form a symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship with any other living thing you know and it's so it's a fundamental it's a human right it's an organismic right the right to symbiose you know using that term as a verb and this is what we've been doing with these psychedelics and every other plant and fungus that's been valued by humans over the course of history i mean the foods and medicines and all these things are not different these are all you know in these relationships like you know it, it's tremendous benefit to the mushroom to be domesticated you know in a certain way because mushrooms agenda just as an example you know is pretty simple they they just want to grow they want to spread that's what they do that's their whole thing and so if we take them under our wing, as it were, and start cultivating them, spreading them around, hey, that's all good from the mushroom's perspective. You know, they're on easy street. They they don't have to compete with things in the wild. So if we make uh, domestic partners of these things there, and it's good for the mushroom, at least until we destroy the entire planet, and then nobody wins, you know. But <laughs> maybe maybe some of the... Some of the insights that we get from our mushroom experiences will help slow that down. I mean, you know, that that can be hoped for as well. So well said. And with that, I would like to extend gratitude to you, Dennis McKenna, for taking your time to join us today. For the listeners that would like to learn more, you can go to McKenna.academy. There's also a subheading entitled ESPD, which stands for Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs, 
where you are invited to view videos recorded from the conference series that the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy was gracious in hosting. I'd also like to extend thanks to our sponsor and host today, Volterra Lewis Gale from Psychedelics Anonymous. For those listening in, you can go to psychedelicsanonymous.com to learn more. And Dennis, we will look to you for those additional links for resources and invite those who are inspired to please donate to the McKenna Academy with whatever you are willing and able to do. I would love to turn it over to you with any closing uh, remarks or final thoughts. Right. Well, uh, yes. So thank you for mentioning both of those, especially ESPD 55. People should go to ESPD55.com and then we'll steal your email and you have to put in a a, uh, a password and then it's completely open. You can look at anything on that site. We ha- This is a conference we did in the UK in last May. There's just lots of good stuff there, you know, especially for people in this interest group. So ESPD55.com. Uh, well, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm happy that you invited me. I'm, I'm really encouraged by what's happening. And I feel like, you know, in some ways I've been watching this since I got interested in psychedelics as a teenager. And that was... A long time ago, you know, uh, so I've been involved in this since, you know, the mid-60s. And I think in the mid-60s, we never imagined that we would be at this place right now. I think that this is a reflection of, as a culture, we are maturing, you know. And even though in the 60s, there was an overreaction, it was a very turbulent time, like it is now, but there was a kind of overreaction lsd was the social catalyst you know and timothy leary was kind of the messianic figure and it it scared a lot of people and unfortunately because of that the research was suppressed and and you know decisions were made by people who should never make those kinds of decisions basically politicians you know, uh, to suppress this stuff. And that shut down research for over 20 years, you know. And then finally, it began to open up in the early 90s with Rick Strassman's work. Uh, But when I look back on, on these decades and the whole war on drugs in general, you know, I, and now you know, that the, that the potential for psychedelics for healing is being recognized. I have to look back on those decades and think how many people weren't helped that could have been helped by psychedelics, but because they were prohibited and stigmatized and illegal, they didn't get the help that they could have benefited from. How many people have died or how many people's lives were ruined because they could not access this kind of therapy so as a longtime advocate of it i'm i'm happy to see that things seem to be turning around you know we live in a very exciting time right now for psychedelics and i'm i'm optimistic and excited i share in your optimism we are in a renaissance and i think the paradigm shift is upon us and i thank you once again and Thank everybody for tuning in for today's webinar. Until next time, take care. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This episode is brought to you by forestbars.com natural supplements for human enhancement. Forrest produces full-spectrum bioactive mushroom-infused chocolate with powerful benefits, sustainably sourced and served. Receive 10% off your first order with code 0HOUR10.